<clears throat> I, well, we have a confession to make. We're hackers, we're thieves, we're criminals. We've been stealing code for years. In order to protect our identities. I, I'm sorry, Todd, but I'm, I'm sorry, but this, this, is, this is way too hot. <sighs> well, I said we have to protect no, our identities. I mean, it's crazy hot in this thing, and it's really <laughs> freaking itchy. <sighs> Mine's fine. We have to protect our identities. Is yours itchy? No. <laughs> well, can we trade? God, no. Um, well, can I take mine off? No, we have to protect our identities. <laughs> but, uh, I'm sorry, I gotta take this off. It's killing me. Ugh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot better. But now everybody knows who we are. Then we steal code. Well, so everybody does it. No, no, they don't. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everybody in this room, everybody in our community, we'd all be wearing masks. Uh, yeah, they kind of do steal code. <laughs> GitHub isn't stealing code. Well, of course it is. You browse into somebody's code, you look at how they did it, then maybe you take it and write it yourself. Or, or worse yet, you cut and paste it. Well, sure, but... Well, how about this? I bet every single person in this room has gone to this site, copied some snippet of code, and pasted it into your project. But that's not stealing code the entire point of Stack Overflow. Really? Because their copyright policy specifically says they own everything. Well, except not every site is Stack Overflow. How about JS Bin's policy? If you put it out there, it's free to use. I see Remini in the back. He's the one that created it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's open tools like these that make it possible for sharing. So sure, JSBin is super awesome and we're all thankful for it, but the majority of other sites out there... So you're saying we're all criminals? Uh, not just that, but we've been doing it for years. That's, that's some serious traffic. What is it, 19 billion global views in six years? That's yeah, a lot that, of stealing. It's, it's years and years of stealing. Sure, people we know, people in this very room admitted to stealing code. <laughs> Even some of the speakers you're going to hear this weekend, like Rachel and Remy and Pam, even one of the founders of NPM, admit to stealing code. We've all been stealing code for years, decades even. Really? Decades? Sure. Before GitHub, there was SourceForge. Oh, right, right. And before that, we would go into the, the forums. Right. You guys remember digging through all the PHP forums just to figure out how to write a blog? Well, sure, except PX. Yeah, PHP completely sucks. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> uh, so what were you doing before you trolled the forums? Um, well, I first learned JavaScript using view source in the 90s. Oh, right, view source. That was, uh, that was great. When was the last time you needed that? I mean, browser dev tools today are amazing. Well, even before that, we had all these, these magazines with code in them. Right, so you would uh, open the magazine, sit down, and then like type the code from the magazine into your computer. But that's, that's not stealing. Well, I was just using those magazines to figure out how, how to do it. Well, it still sounds fundamentally like a cut and paste job. Well, how did you start programming? Well, I started on one of these sweet Commodore pets. <sighs> but how did you start programming it? Well, I just leaned over to the kid next to me and asked him what to do. And he showed you what? Well, he showed me his code. And you copied it? Well, we didn't have cut and paste back then. <laughs> but you typed it in. Well, yeah, he told me what to type. Thus, you stole his code, but what did you do next? Well, I started changing things. I started trying things out. You made it your own. Uh, exactly. Instead of an asterisk chasing a pound side, I made it chase a dot. So you took his idea and you subverted it in your own manner. Well, but doesn't the act of changing something make it mine and not his? I, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't think you can copyright an idea after all. You just copyright the expression of the idea. So you're telling me we're not criminals? I, I think so. Uh, you're suggesting that the act of changing what we steal makes it legit. Well, I 
think it's a little more complicated than that. You're not a lawyer, though. Well, but what about the <laughs> what about the fair use clause? Well, what about when your client comes to you and they say they want a parallax site, and you've never even heard what a parallax site is? Does the research aspect come into play when you cut and paste from Stack Overflow? Well, again, I'm not a lawyer. No, no, you're not. But I do think there's a, uh, a good kind of code stealing. Good stealing? Sure. <laughs> Otherwise, all these people are in a lot of trouble. So how do you know what is good stealing and what is bad stealing? Uh, well, I think it comes down to intent. <sighs> intent? Sure. Why are you stealing the code? Is it to take money away from the copyright owner, or are you just trying to finish the customer's request so you can go home to your wife and kids? Or are you just trying to learn how to do it for yourself? So you think it's OK if our intent is to learn? Right. It has to be. Again, otherwise, the whole industry is in trouble. How's that? Well, think back to your days using view source, copying the code and code that you saw there. Well, I didn't copy it, per se. Of course you did, but you changed it, right? Well, yeah, I wanted to see how it worked. And then you changed it some more. Sure. And so on. You were learning through the change. Well, yeah, that, that's how I work. Right. Well, that's my point. We have an entire industry of tinkers. It's baked into what we do. OK, I see. We steal the code to learn, and then we learn by tinkering. Right. Well, my daughter does the exact same thing. Really? Watch this. <laughs> Come on, let's go. <laughs> she's pretty cute. <laughs> it's, it's true, but my point is that she's learning by exploring. She's trying new things. Well, so she's gaining experience through experimentation, or as they say in the slide here, the bottom two lines, the practice by doing and immediate use. Right. Actually, when you think about it, it's the primary way that people learn. We replicate, we change, we observe, and then we understand. Uh, except when we fail. No, well, failing is part of the process. Well, fail often, fail fast. And learn always. The goal of experimentation, whether successful or not, is understanding. So I steal code, but in a good way, to experiment on it. And ultimately gain new understanding and then build on that. Build on that? Sure. Once you understand something, you can use it to understand the next thing up the chain, the bigger understanding. But if that's how we learn, why did I spend all those years, and more importantly, all that money doing this? OK, you bring up a great point. Me? I did? The other approach is rote learning, where the understanding is dictated to you, and you're supposed to accept it as fact. Well, but again, as we see here, uh, the retention rate for lecture-based learning is really, really low. Well, exactly. There's no chance to explore what you're learning. It's all memorization. But you're working from the top down. Lectures, reading, presentations, there isn't a chance to do anything. Right. It's a different tactic. They give you the understanding, and then they let you figure out how to prove it. But the stealing way, you're figuring out how something works, and then you gain understanding? Yes. So that's great news because school sucks. <laughs> OK, I'm not saying that. There's a place for both. Well, except the bottom up approach is more how we work. We've already admitted to all these people that we're stealing code and tinkering on it. Well, maybe that's the problem with how we're teaching our next generation. So too much book learning, not enough experimentation? It's almost too rigid. We end up with college graduates who don't understand the why, the things, why things work the way they do. They often lack the tools to figure it out. So how do they get those tools? How does a person that's been shorted the ability to tinker learn to tinker? How do we teach people to steal in a good way? Well, it's a really interesting topic. But for now, we're going to take a little detour. All right, let's have it. This is the Mona Lisa. Oh, it's by Da Vinci. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know how Da Vinci learned to paint? I'm very sure that he didn't take CS 311. Exactly. He was an apprentice to a painter and sculptor, Andrea Del Verrocchio. He taught Da Vinci all sorts of things like metallurgy, sculpting, and painting. In fact, they painted this together. It's said that when they finished, Verrocchio was so taken away by Da Vinci's work that he put down his paintbrush never to paint again. 
Well, that's great, but what does it have to do with stealing code? My point is that in the olden, uh, olden days, disciplines were taught through apprenticeship. Da Vinci was an apprentice to Verrocchio, and in turn, apprentice uh, some of his own, even including Raphael, who painted this. Oh, those look really similar. Right, an apprentice learns through the process of mimicking his master's technique. Okay, but we're not in the olden days anymore. It's all about educating at scale. How uh, we're mass communicating. But for our field, like Da Vinci's, maybe it's better for us to get our hands dirty. Well, now you lost me. The goal of an apprenticeship is to learn how your master does things. But you start small, doing the little work your master no longer has time to do. Oh, right, the scut work, like writing tests. Right. But over time, you grow to do more and more evolved work. Build all on all that scut work you did initially. So what you're saying is maybe we need to teach computer programming like we're teaching art. In an art class, you get the theory and history, but ultimately, you're exploring your ideas from day one in your studio work. And? Well, most CS classes are theory and formulas, but you really don't get a chance to explore until your senior level stuff, possibly even grad school. So what you're saying sounds like it really comes down to where the opportunity to create lies. Exactly. Art classes have you creating from day one, but CS classes don't have you creating until the end. So? Well, we just said that we steal code to understand it, to take it apart, to make it our own. Doesn't that sound more like the, the art class example than the CS class example? All right, yeah, it kind of does. And actually, the apprenticeship paradigm isn't just about art. Lots of other fields use it, like music. I mean, The Voice is basically a show about landing an apprenticeship and in architecture and design. Walter Gropius, who was the founder of the Bauhaus School, uh, said the best kind of practical teaching is the old system of free apprenticeship to a master craftsman, which was devoid of any scholastic taint. And even in physics, Einstein said the only source of knowledge is experience. Todd. Oh, sorry. Let's get back on topic. Oh, right. I was going to say that while, you, while I agree with you, we don't really do apprenticeships anymore. They went out with the Industrial Revolution, let's say 50, 100, 150 years ago. Well, yes and no. No? Well, we have apprentices now. We just call them entry-level developers or interns. That's, uh, that's, that's where you learn that almost everything they just taught you in college is worthless. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty unfortunate. But wouldn't it be better if entry-level devs started with the knowledge they really need to know to do their job? Like, how to Google Stack Overflow for answers. Well, actually, yes. Ooh, points for Glenn. <laughs> Remember when we said we were stealing code to tinker so that we can learn? Well, it's our topic. OK, right. Well, wouldn't it be great if the entry-level dev showed up on day one and knew how to do that? Yeah, but I don't think that's about to change anytime soon. I, no, it's not. So maybe it's on us to teach the new employees. Uh, yeah. So what are the ways that we do that? Well, um, well there's, uh, there's pair programming. Sure. Pairing is a learning technique that's a perfect for example for this. It's code stealing with a friend. <laughs> in, a good, in a good pair, uh, one person's writing the code while the other is constantly copying stuff off of Stack Overflow. Okay. <laughs> Let's not get really carried away here. But, but you do get what I'm saying, right? Right. One person is hands on the keyboard. The other person is thinking the bigger thoughts. Well, but I, I feel with pair programming, it's really easy to begin nitpicking on each other. Well, it's not a perfect system. Oh, and speaking of nitpicking, what about um, uh, code reviews? Yeah, it's, it's another way to teach when it's done right. I've been on far too many code reviews where people use it as a way to show superiority. That's unfortunate. If you lay out some sensible ground rules, a code review can be an incredibly powerful teaching tool. So I guess that's then it's about, it comes down to the personalities and their adherence to the rules. Yeah. So what else do we do with new developers to help them learn the lay of the land? Well, you can use your workflow to teach. Uh, how do you mean? Like teaching a pull request workflow for code reviews. Yeah, I'm still not following you. Okay, you use your workflow process to automate things to encourage conversation. With a pull request, you can assign it to a specific person to get their feedback. It provides uh, you with the initial opportunity to start a teaching moment. 
So instead of leaving your people out there on their own, you're using the process to encourage communication? Exactly. It's especially useful for a newer person to assign a pull request to someone more knowledgeable. Oh, so they're actively asking for learn, to learn. By creating a conversation by, about what you're doing. OK, but I feel like that becomes really dependent on the process. Well, yeah, a good process is everything. It really all it depends on your company having a culture of learning, the, a process that fosters learning. OK, but that, that has to come from the top. Yeah, the management has to create and nurture a great culture. Well, so I would argue that the first person in a company to help new people needs to be the managers. They need to be very active in making sure the new hires don't just learn the best way to code, but they learn the best way to participate. Well, that's an interesting argument, but I think a lot of managers would disagree. Uh, um, they're, they're always too busy. If they didn't want to manage people, maybe they shouldn't be managers. <laughs> well, I I'm a manager. <laughs> do you manage people? I do. So do you practice what you preach? Well, I'm a firm believer in being in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, rolling up my sleeves, working with my employees, uh, working side by side. So that's another way that we mentor on the job, through a nurturing environment. Sure, and by actively participating, I'm not just helping a new person, I'm helping myself, but more importantly, I'm helping the team. You're helping the culture through mentoring. Precisely, and it goes beyond the workplace. Okay, it does? Sure, I also mentor outside of work. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Tell us all about it. Right, so I work with uh, Baltimore Node School. I help others learn JavaScript, Node, even the fundamentals of programming. Actually, there is a Node School event running right this very second that I'm missing to be here with all of you. We do have a pool and the beach, oh. but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that you're missing it. Um, Node School sounds awesome. I enjoy it, and more importantly, it's getting us back to the subject at hand of how we can give people who haven't had the chance to learn to steal code the skills to learn to steal code. All right, can we agree to stop calling this stealing code? Well, what do you want to call it? Uh, uh, tinkering? The, 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 no. Hijacking? No, pass. Um, creative borrowing. All right, all right, I like it. It's teaching people how to creatively borrow. Okay, how so? Well, Node School works by asking you to solve a problem and giving you vague ideas of where to find help to solve that problem. Live events take it a step further by pairing people together and encouraging them to learn together. Okay, this sounds perfect for what we're talking about. Well, absolutely, but let's not spend a lot of time on it. How about some other programs? Do you know any? Um, I don't know, you, you hear about all these hack days and training things? Well, let's get more specific. Okay, uh, Hack Reactor. Well, hack Reactor is an interesting example, but it's, it's one you pay for. Let's, let's focus on some free ones. All right, I, I work with a lot of Rails devs. They tell me about um, RailsBridge. Uh, it's the Rails version of Node School. Okay. Um, I was in a coffee shop the other day, and a guy told me about Hacker Hours. So this is really interesting. It's where you show up, you code, you throw up your hand if you have a question. The organizers will give you some help. Even if they don't know the language, um, they'll find a way to get you help, a source for your creative borrowing. They're literally teaching you how to tinker at its basis form. That's pretty sweet. I especially like that their date is in epoch time. So what else you got for us? OK, there's also um, the Women Who Code. Uh, this is a national organization. They host events all over the place, all the time, helping uh, women get into tinkering. Cool, but you notice what you've done here. What did I do? Well, you've moved from talking about mentoring to talking about community. Uh, Interesting. Um, well, maybe that's the answer to the question. Through communities? Well, communities that mentor, communities that nurture new people specifically. Well, like women who code. Well, Node School and Hacker Hours and a dozen different organizations. Well, this year at EmberComp, they started Women Helping Women. This is a specifically a mentorship program for women in tech, not just for coding and, and code reviews, but for leadership and getting people to speak and for blogs. Uh, there's also Global Day of Code Retreat. And this is starting with a specific problem, Conway's Game of Life, 
and you show up and you hack on whatever language you want. You get help and people pair and, and switch off all day long. There's also International Nobot Day. I mean, I actually learned about this at the last JSConf. Um, I mean, I'm sure a ton of people here do robots and love JavaScript, so it's a full day of that. Oh, my company, uh, Big Nerd Ranch. A uh, gratuitous plug. <laughs> <laughs> we host a number of hack nights, and we have, we're working in languages like Android and iOS, front end and JavaScript, and um, we do a lot of hardware stuff and design. But it's com communities like these that make it possible for everybody to get involved, and that's the important thing. Well, but it's more than just teaching people how to borrow creatively. Yeah? Sure. It's about teaching people how to see from different points of view as well. Okay, now I'm not following you. Okay, well, consider our initial problem. I go to Stack Overflow or wherever and uh, cut and paste some code. Right, yeah, borrow it creatively. <laughs> sure, but then I change it. Thus preventing you from doing any hard time. Right, but how do I know to change it? Well, it's, it's code. It's the nature of it. Sure, right, but if I only ever knew about one thing, say oranges, for example, how could I ever imagine a banana? Okay, you're talking about our ability to see beyond what we already know, about using our imagination. Well, partially, but I'm also talking about a thing called um, uh, integral philosophy, right, where our understanding of all that comes before helps us build what comes after. So imagining a banana is only possible because you know about oranges. Right, and the next step beyond that is only possible because you know about oranges and bananas. It's cumulative. Well, it's comprehensive. It's integrated. Exactly. But how does that apply to communities? Well, the more we consider different points of view and the more we let different voices into our community, the greater our ability to comprehend that which, uh, the greater our ability to comprehend stuff beyond what we know. That's what these communities are doing. Women Who Code, Node School, they give us a chance to participate in the community of ideas, the diversity of human experience. And teach not just how to really tinker, but to also understand. Well, understand code. Well, and people. So is that it? We admit to being thieves, but we're all thieves, and we're all creative borrowers, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, because that's how we work. Well, there's just one more thing. All right. Well, it's all yours. Well, it's on us to make sure that the people coming into this field, the newbies, if you will, have the ability and the opportunity to learn that, to understand it, to use it to build something better. By which you mean? Well, community is great, but it has to start somewhere. It has to be led by someone. So it'd be great if we were at some sort of, I don't know, let's call it a conference where we could tell a bunch of people this. So yeah, <laughs> all you sitting out there, we're trying to tell you that being a great developer isn't just about knowing how to tinker. Or knowing how to creatively borrow from Stack Overflow. Being a great developer is about being willing to help others learn to be great developers, to learn to tinker, and to grow, and to understand. We're trying to tell you that just watching a community from the sidelines isn't enough. You need to get out there, be part of it, nurture it, grow it lead it. And that brings us to this moment now. Right now, right this second, you've already begun the process. I'm willing to bet that the person sitting next to you knows something that you don't. <laughs> Actually, that, that's a really great point. Ooh, points for Glenn. <laughs> all these people, all these JSConf attendees, they've taken the first step. Uh, they have? Yeah, sure. How long have we known each other? A few years, I guess. And how did we meet? Ooh, have you met my friend Todd? <laughs> no, I mean, where did we meet? Well, we met down on the beach over there at JSConf um, 2013, I believe. Right. And here we are, two and a half years later. On a stage, so to speak. Collaborating together. And all because of this conference. And the people that run it, Chris and Laura, and the entire JSConf staff. They've created an amazing community. They realize exactly what we just spent 30 minutes trying to figure out together. That sharing a community is everything. Everyone here has taken the first steps towards better sharing. Sharing, but more than that, sharing of ideas? <clears throat>
sharing of code like we've been talking about, <laughs> and sharing of ideas. And sharing of experiences. It all makes us better programmers. Better people. And in the end, isn't that what it's all about? No, no, no. It's been about stealing code. <laughs> and being proud of it. He's Glenn Goodwin. He works for SAS Institute. You can find him at RINet. And he's Todd Gandhi. You, he works for Big Nerd Ranch. And you can find him at T. Gandhi. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.